Love is the greatest threat to the status quo. Welcome to the sixth annual uh, Black Sustainability Summit. My name is Costco Jones. Uh, we're in a session right now pertaining to soil and soil work. Let me give you the formal name. But we make it fertile, African ways of building healthy black soils. Uh, this is this is the sixth annual one uh, of the Black Sustainability Summit. We have uh, Brother Mason Olonade here from Jiggy Jiggy uh, Africulture Podcast. And I'm going to turn it over to him so he can um, start his uh, presentation. Thank you for coming. All right. Peace, everyone. Um, it is an extreme honor to present to you all today the findings of the research that I've gathered uh, through experimentation and production of the podcast. As it was stated in the description, most natural farming practices are born out of a culture of a given ethnic group. Uh, for example, com contemporary composting methods are from Britain by way of India. The fermented, fermented solutions of Korean natural farming were inspired by the garden boosting effects of leftover kimchi juice. When we build healthy black soils, what cultural information do we have to guide us? How does this cultural information translate into agricultural technique? Instead of turning compost piles, how can we leverage life to transform our wastes into natural resources? So before we get started, uh, just a short bio about me is that I'm a designer for the Pattern House of Olonade. Throughout the talk, various tenets of Eko Nipa Iroko, or what I'm calling African natural farming, will be illustrated through pattern and proverb or Yoruba Owe. These proverbs help guide our spiritual and agricultural discipline. In the podcast, we believe that building a healthy soil builds a healthy soul. So we share strategies for how to do both. To do both today with you allows me to fulfill a core need of mine to share valuable information with other brilliant African people, thereby blackening green thumbs and artfully cultivating the creation of healthy black soils in the future. So our presentation today will cover three major co components illustrated by three proverbs. Many of this will mean nothing to you now unless you've been following us on our uh, Pattern House Instagram page. So in our first section of uh, uprooting cassava, can you guys see my um, mouse and stuff when I'm here or no? Yes, sir, we can see the mouse. Okay, great. All right, so our first section of uprooting cassava will present a light introduction into Japanese and Korean natural farming and composting and how we practice other people's rituals as we grow our food. In the second section, other people's wisdom, we will share some of the early wisdom of Eko Nipa Iroko, uh, the art of cultivating the soil, why it's necessary, some of the philosophy behind it through exploring the practices of contemporary and historical era African agriculture. And in our final section, yam to cornmeal, uh, we, will dis, uh, we will talk about three practices to recruit life to the farm to make more life. And then at the end, we'll have questions. <laughs> All right, due to the scope of this talk, I will be making some pretty advanced arguments. Um, so I'll need you to be familiar with a couple of different things. Um, so uh, if you don't know these things, um, you can ask me about them later, but I'm not gonna explain any of these things. Like a light grasp of Eastern philosophy, good familiarity with traditional African spirituality, a couple of seasons of growing plants for consumption, whether it's for you or for production at your farm, a tolerance for seeing maggots, specifically black soldier fly larvae, um, the ability to extend forgiveness to me for my American tongue um, in pronouncing some of these Yoruba words. And then um, you'll be able to accept a lot of information and that if you have questions, you'll be able to type them in the chat for me to answer at the conclusion. Um, and with this information, I'm saying that I'm using a lot of words and an overwhelming amount of information to prove the feeling that we've experienced every time you stick your hands in the soil it is an act of Sankofa. Extraordinary and extraordinary claims require extraordinary and extraordinary evidence, and I provide both. So with our first proverb, here we go. Igiti eni ba la i a ki fa a tu bi tege ka. What does that mean? A tree that one's father plants does not uproot, but that does not apply to cassava. One must tra treat tradition and patrimony with reverence, but one should know when exceptions are called for. So that's what we're talking about in this section. My approach to farming used to be technical, and after a couple of years, it has taken it has become intensely philosophical. I took my observations from the soil into research and study and found something very interesting about the techniques and practices of Japanese natural farming, Korean natural farming, 
and composting. Ethnic ideology and cultural philosophy created these techniques that have boasted incredible yields and increased health back into the environment. At the, at the time I was an adherent of KNF and interviewed people on a podcast about Korean and Japanese natural farming. From then on, I wondered, what is it about culture that informs agriculture? In my hometown of DC, there is an elder, Baba Duno, who you cannot see without him saying, there is no culture without agriculture. I will progress through each group in this way. I'll give a short synopsis of their thought, an agricultural reflection of that thought, and then a question that I asked from it that led me to presenting to you today. So first we'll begin with Japanese natural farming and Masanobu Fukuoka's The One Straw Revolution. This is, that book is, pretty, uh, is why he is widely regarded as the father of natural farming. Fukuoka's technique is well-grounded in the philosophies of Shinto and Zen Buddhism with its other name being do nothing farming. I like this adage of his when he was beginning his journey into natural or do nothing farming. By the end of the war, when I went up to the citrus, or citrus orchard to practice what I then thought was natural farming, I did no pruning and left the orchard to itself. The branches became tangled. The trees were attacked by insects and almost two acres of the mandarin orange trees withered and died. From that time on the question, what is the natural pattern was always on in my mind. In the process of arriving at the answer, I wiped out another 400 trees. Finally, I felt like I could say with certainty, this is the natural pattern. This, this is the natural pattern, is the Eastern wisdom that is so captivating and intoxicating. This paradoxical talk is intriguing and much wisdom and much practical wisdom can be applied from it. One example of an agricultural reflection from the technique is the following. As for cucumbers, the creeping on the ground variety is the best. You have to take care of young plants, occasionally cutting the weeds, but after that, the plants will grow strong. Lay out bamboo or the branches of a tree and cucumbers will twine all over them. The branches keep the fruit just above the ground so that it does not rot. This method of growing cucumbers also works for melons and squash. Uh, let me see how I did this. Um, so I wanted to just show uh, that in, in this particular area, I, this is when I was living in DC, behind, behind this picture is an alley and a, uh, uh, a thunderstorm happened and broke off this dead tree branch and this dead tree branch landed in my yard. And so I adapted what Fukuoka was talking about and set up these branches in this kind of tensegrity structure, if you guys are familiar with that. And then the butternut squash climbed, eventually climbed up these, uh, these trees. And then all of the fruit, fruiting happened here. All of my butternut squashes fruited here, not anywhere else, and kept them above the ground and they did not rot, exactly like how he was saying. So let's move on to Korean natural farming. Um, my my uh, argument is made for me right in the subtitle of the next book. In this beautiful act of legacy building, Young Sang Cho continued his thought, family's tradition and systematized it in an agricultural discipline and for its adherence, a way of life. And so what I'm saying is this is Jadam Organic Farming by Young Sang Cho. And he says a revolutionary farming method based on Oriental philosophy. So this is what I'm talking about. Um, from his father's book, um, Dr. Hyung Kyu Cho, he said kimchi, which is made by adding a variety of spices and condiments to vegetables, is not only a food source rich in nutrition, but it helps digestion. Abundant lactic acid bacteria in the kimchi soup do this job. Some smart farmers tried to apply kimchi in farming. My father was one. My father never threw away leftover kimchi juice, which is very sour, but instead poured it into a container filled with feces and added water. He then used it as a fertilizer so that crops grew healthy and strong. This got me to thinking, if him and feces treated with kimchi juice is good for crops, why not use the kimchi juice directly? So I did some experimentation and applied diluted kimchi juice directly to the growing of crops. I tested to see whether hot pepper seeds dipped in old kimchi sauce would germinate. Um, the results were better than I expected. Preparing the seeds by dipping them in kimchi juice meant that even old seeds sprouted and all the plants were healthy. This, the success of my experiments led me to use other plants for kimchi ingredients and FPJ, fermented plant juice. Fermented plant juice is the eventual result. In essence, it's the same process to make FPJ as kimchi, except that salt has been replaced with brown sugar. Um, he, later say, he later says, um, when making fermented plant juice, choose plants which grow first in the spring. Oh, sorry, that's not what I wanted to say. All things created by nature are imbued with energy and plants are no exception. Plants overflowing with energy are all around us. 
we can utilize a variety of weeds, crop remnants, and wild plants from the mountains and the sea uh, as ingredients when making uh, fermented plant juice. Any vigorously healthy plant is good. I want you guys to keep that in mind for the future. Um, another thing that I really liked most about this book, Jadam, was his teardown of composting and organic agriculture as a whole. It is frustrating that people think of Sir Albert Howard's An Agricultural Testament of the 19, uh, either the 1900s and similar books as the Gospel of Organic Agriculture. They believe J.I. Rodale started an organic farming based on Howard's book. However, the history of organic farming began long before that. It is true that an agricultural testimony, uh, testament played a pivotal role in making the theory and disseminating the Indian method of compost making. Unfortunately, the work made a serious mistake. It overcomplicated the process of making farm inputs. It talks about working to increase aeration, turning to meet optimum moisture level, uh, improving carbon and nitrogen ratio. And these, in Jadam's opinion, are complicated, difficult, and unnecessary. It seems that Sir, Albert, uh, Sir Howard had his focus not on the nutritional aspect, but on eliminating odor. And that's also important. He overlooked the importance of making technology easy so that the public can more readily accept it. And um, later, because we're stretched for time a little bit, he also sort of denigrates uh, Rudolf Steiner and J.I. Rodale for uh, uh, J.I. Rudolf Steiner of biodynamic farming, J.I. Rodale of Acres USA, and that kind of organic, organic farming thing. And he talks about some of the history of uh, ancient Korean agriculture. Um, and uh, <laughs> and through it, it is very hard to disagree with Young Sang Cho. In our opinion, um, since we're here talking about Africa and her people, it is better to agree in kind with Young Sang with saying the very similar words of the immortal and esteemed Nana Kwame Afrani, Dr. George Washington Carver. Here are two pictures of him from Land and Power, Sustainable Agriculture and African Americans uh, that was published by the USDA. Nana Kwame Aframi, Dr. George Washington Carver states in his bulletin number six, how to build up worn out soils. We think it is wise to state here that the chief aim was to keep every operation within reach to the poorest tenant farmer occupying the poorest possible soils. On our podcast page, we have uh, collected to the best of our knowledge for the first time, all of Dr. Carver's bulletins online and in one place for free. Please visit the resources page uh, for our talk, which I'm about to put in the chat, uh, jiggyjiggy.org slash BSS, um, which is up now. You just copy that and we'll have all the links and resources from this talk. So, um, <laughs> so now we're going to the Indo-Aryan Brotherhood, compost equals yoga, mounds of colonialism. Um, so as we remember from what we were just reading, um, Young Sang was talking about Sir Albert Howard um, and his agricultural testament. And in that book, um, what Sir Albert Howard did was sort of talk about the refinement method of compost and seeing in India, seeing a whole bunch of manure piles everywhere that eventually turned into compost. And he kind of systematized that, that process of turning manure into compost. But was that all that he saw in those Indian fields? The Hindu spiritual leader Ramesh Oza through his educational institution Sandipani states, Three, uh, 33 million demigods reside in the mother cow, Gao Mata. Cow is our, uh, Gao Mata is our mother. The atmosphere of a house where there is a cow is very pure. Since all demigods are present in a cow, we do not consider the cow as an ordinary animal. This is a part of our culture. When 33 million demigods resided in the cow, Lakshmi arrived late. She said to the mother cow, Mataji, please provide me with the space too. Mother cow replied, sorry, house full. To this, Lakshmi said, you have given everyone a place, why not me? Mother cow replied, there is no other place except one now, which is my cow dung. Lakshmi accepted this happily and resided in the cow dung. This is why cow dung is spread inside houses traditionally. Lakshmi is present where earth is pure, when used as manure, it feels as though plants grow, that the plants that grow are not just plants, it is invaluable wealth. Such is the importance of our holy mother cow. And so when Howard was there as a botanist in India around the 20th century, he saw these piles of manure just sitting and later turning into this fine manure, but he did not see them for what they also were. They're 
they were an altar. He saw them instead as a resource. By transforming and industrializing the resource, it moved the religious aspects and left the practical aspects. This is an even better agricultural product and so much so that we all use it today. The thing that makes this acceptable is why I'm calling this the Indo-Aryan Brotherhood because compost is just the same as yoga. But the way that I'm making this particular thing is through Gandhi. One of the first battles that Gandhi fought after coming, oh, sorry, let me, for Al Jazeera, Tamoga Hinder writes in the article, coming to terms with Gandhi's complicated legacy. One of the first battle Gandhi fought after coming to South Africa was over the separate entrances for black, white and black people at the Durban post office. Gandhi objected that Indians were classified with the natives of South Africa, who he derogatorily labeled as Kafirs and demanded a separate entrance for Indians. During his time in South Africa, Gandhi repeatedly underlined the shared Indo-Aryan roots of the Indian and European peoples and argued that due to this historical connection, the British Empire should treat Indians more respectfully than Black Africans. In an open letter to the Parliament of Colonial South Africa, he wrote, I venture to point out that the English and the Indians spring from a common stock called the Indo-Aryan. This belief serves as the basis for operations for, uh, for those who are trying to unify the hearts of two races, which are legally and outwardly bound together under a common flag. Um, Gandhi's, uh, Gandhi's unflinching loyalty to the British based on shared racial, racial ancestry and disdain for native peoples of Africa ran so deep that leading scholars believed during his time in South Africa, he stood, at, he stood out as not one of, not as one of the, uh, not as one of apartheid's first opponents, but as one of its first proponents. Seeing the Indian as the progenitor of the Aryan is completely fine and a larger cultural ex acceptation for the religiosity to be stripped and industrialized into a fine humus. This is the same process of yoga. The yoga that we know today, because I have to speed through this, the yoga that we know today is really a, <laughs> a perversion of what was ancient practiced in, or what was practiced in an ancient time in yoga. And what it really was, uh, what we know today, I'll just say, as a result of this policy, many Indian and European uh, administrators, intellectuals, and public officials began supporting the creation of a new modern India that combined the best of what modernity and the West had to offer, but in a traditional Indian form. Years of colonial rule had resulted in numerous stereotypes of Indian effeminacy and degeneracy narratives that implied Indians were physically and racially degraded. In other words, inferior to whites. Reappropriating Hatha Yoga became part of a larger project of Indian nation building and the construction of a new Indian man designed to combat these stereotypes. So when people look at India as a source of organic agriculture because of these composting roots, they're, they're thinking that it's an Indian thing when it's really a British thing, but really they're one sort of people. This is what they say. And so what I'm saying is, is that when we are making these healthy things for our soil, all three of these things are somebody else's rituals and that we have our own rituals to practice as it relates to agriculture. And I wanna be clear, oh, and so um, when, when, when um, and I think that that's a, a, a larger thing because I think that, that the, the cultural information and the spiritual information being stripped and being left with science is uh, the source of our frustration with hard sciences as Africans. We tend to see science stripped of spirit, sometimes professed in spite of spirit. I understand, but I do not hold that position. In this talk, through some of the following agricultural practices I describe, the science that we practice is full of spirit. It is a choice to see it that way. I wanna be clear in stating that I have no beef with any of the methods previously described. My itch came from seeing these ethnic groups responding to their challenges in their unique ways. In what ways did we respond to those same challenges? Being a philosophical kind of guy, I figured I'd ask other black folks about the truth. It is well known that the healthiest soils are black. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nation holds yearly conferences and symposiums about black soils. Protect black soils, invest in the future. Um, scientifically, the soil is black for a variety of reasons. Organic matter is in high concentration, broken down to its most indivisible state, absorbing all light and reflecting so little makes up that blackness. 
But why? I believe that answering that almost unanswerable question will lead all of us into an agricultural technique that will work wherever Black people are. Uprooting the cassava leaves, as we've just done, or examining the schools of thought that inform our techniques we have practiced is, is instrumental in identifying the roots of the techniques that we will practice. Identifying this was the beginning, identifying the process of uprooting cassava was the beginning of the formation of what I then called African natural farming. That sounds nice, but it isn't, but nice isn't what we want. We want the best that we can achieve in accordance with Sankofa. For all that we are doing is applied Sankofa in the same way that chemistry is applied physics, biology is applied chemistry, and agriculture is applied biology. So this is what I am thinking about. I call Nipa Iroko. This is written in the Inco script of Guinea, but this is Yoruba. Eko, eko nipa iroko, according to Coyote fucking Lede in his Yorba English Dictionary, is the definition of agriculture. Literally, it means the art of cultivating the soil. In my opinion, as it is well documented in our tradition, names have meaning, intention, and limitations. I consider the inclusion of spirit into the science as the full meaning of the art. And thinking over this concept of an, an idea, it's only, it's, relatively recent, only exists for about a year now. So I don't have everything, you know, codified and all that kind of stuff. Like life takes time to be able to get to that place. And as my fiance says, we have to give time, time. So most important for the development of these tenets of Eko Nipa Iroko is you, my siblings of the soil. Uh, Eko Nipa Iroko is not created for me to be the face or to satisfy my ego. It is ideally a community thought process because without you, I am not. So this next proverb initiates us into some of the thoughts that create Eko Nipa Iroko. So this says, Agban, Alagban, Lafi, Nshagban, Imoran, Enikan, Ota, Bora. And that means one learns wisdom from other people's wisdom, Nshagban. Um, one's person's knowledge does not amount to anything. Wisdom and knowledge are best to be shared. Other people's wisdom or our people's wisdom is what we learn from. This is Sankofa. Let us share it amongst one another. Now, um, so where we will start from first is the beginning of time in Kemet, right? The Zeptepi. Um, we cover this in one of our episodes, Esotericisms. You'll find that in that link that I put in the chat, um, jiggyjiggy.org slash BSS. Um, and so in, in Kemet, uh, we can, they, it, it's crazy because they created time specifically for agriculture. Um, that was uh, talked about in a second series on the manners and customs of the ancient Egyptians. By being able to sort of fix time, the passage of time to the sun, you could reliably predict when the Nile was going to flood. You could begin the planting season right before that. And then the great economic and monumental activity was given birth. Um, so from there, we were going to move west to uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone to this paper that gave us the title of our talk today. Uh, God made the soil, but we made it fertile. Gender, knowledge, and practice in the formation and use of African dark earths in Liberia and Sierra Leone. And uh, we got two new vocab words here, in and co, tutupole here, and por lele. Um, so I'll go and explain. So this is a picture from the paper showing this black soil going down almost uh, six feet below the ground, really about five feet. But regardless, this is amazing, right? And these are soils that are found normally around there. But this is a difference when we are making the soil fertile. Interviewees in Liberia and Ghana describe how these African dark earths form through additions of several types of waste ash and char residues from cooking, byproducts from processing palm oil and producing handmade soap, animal-based organic inputs such as bones from food preparation, harvest residues, and plant biomass-based domestic refuse such as palm thatch, palm fruit heads, and rice straw. This continua these continuous high nutrient, high intensity nutrient and carbon depositions led to an ongoing formation of highly fertile and carbon-rich African dark earths in and around settlements. For example, they observed how after dumping in one spot for a certain amount of time, less than one year, the women burn the pile and spread the ashes and char out for planting. This action is clearly intentional, but the purpose, according to the women, 
is for crops to grow well, not to transform the soil per se, though, a, though this is a long-term outcome that they are certainly aware of. Indeed, different naming and tenuring of land with African dark earths and trees planted with placentas and during burials are all intentional acts related to African dark earths or black soils, but not related to the formation of those black soils itself. So like I said, with this vocabulary word here, tutupole, these places where they dump the soil, this is called, this literally, tutupole means dump, uh, dump site soils, right? And so what I'm kind of adapting it for us in this, in this practice of Eko Nipa Iroko, like I have up here, the tutupole is where we build our soils, right? Where, where our compost are, is created. This is what I'm saying. Later uh, in another one Buddha narrative, so this is down um, further in, in Liberia, um, Carmen Howard attributes the richness of African dark earths to the actions of her ancestors dumping and how this was made, uh, how this has made the town soils the chief of all soils. The black soil was made by God, but made rich by our old people way back. Those things that the old people used to throw in the soil way back are what made the soil rich for planting. Around that town, you can plant pepper, bitterball, banana, plantain. They will grow best, better than on the farm. The reason for this is that we throw the we throw in the gardens around town. The chief is the uh, the black soil is the chief of all soils around here. And so, God made the soil, but we made it fertile. Is something that multiple people had described in this, and I have considered this as its own proverb, so to speak. This OA empowers us to examine this OA, this proverb, God made the soil, but we made it fertile, and empowers us to examine our talents and transform them into standardized processes that work hard for us and our community. This OA reframes our anxiety, and now we become excited by the prospect of the creator and creatress challenging us by delivering us 75% of the way to creating poor lele, or these black, black soils. I didn't get time to go into that, unfortunately. Um, but when when this is what they would call the poor lele, the black, black soils. Um, it is then our grand opportunity to become creative, to epitomize the most natural thing about us, our inherent divinity, to solve our problems. We'll make our soil fertile. So from here, we move north to the Kisidugu prefecture of Guinea, where we will learn about the Kuranko, about deepening our connections from soil to soul. This, uh, this book chapter is so powerful, and unfortunately, I don't have time to get to it because I, I got a couple more slides to go through here. So I wanted to, um, it introduces this concept, uh, this concept of the Tombondu here, and that the Tombondu is the ruined villages. So how they, how they do their agriculture, their villages are, are, are set up in these circles, and then behind, behind the houses, they have gardens that are also set up in concentric circles. And so just like they have their own sort of tutu pole um, forming the poor lele, and then eventually they move from one area and move down to say they, they start their village at the 12 o'clock position in a given area of land, and then move down to the three o'clock position, then move down to the six. Over time, they do this. And then in about 10 years, they re return back to 12 o'clock. But in that previous period of time, the 12 o'clock village, say by the time you get to six o'clock is considered Tombondu. And at this place, um, everything is transformed. Like the, 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 the ground has become uh, a forest that does not burn and stuff like that. And these are the places uh, where, oh, I'll get to this here. Farms which become like Tombondu um, need to be fallowed after four to six years of cultivation, but the fallow vegetation will be a succession to forest, not savanna. After about a decade, farmers return to cultivate these improved places and cycle from one improved area to another, leaving most of the land unfarmed. These improved soils are more than simply, uh, these improved soils are thus more than simply improved soils, as the vegetation associated with them recursively transforms the soil beneath them. When discussing these soils with villagers, one informant likened their farming activity to that of termites, which also transforms the soil, and whose mounds, settlements, and villages once ruined, a prize for their fertility and support uh, and support forest vegetation. Inhabitants, and this is exp this is important. Inhabitants also distinguish the land of a spirit village that they entered only with extreme caution. Spirits live in more or less the same ways as people, and their villages and farming are understood to have similar effects in soil and vegetation as people. Thus, a pervasive assumption in this region is that the settlement itself of people, animal, and spirits 
transforms the initially infertile soils and brings them into fertility. So thusly, it's a recommendation for me and through Ekonipa Iroko for us to create Tombondu in our growing, in our growing spaces. Um, for you, figure out how to get places, uh, how to leave a place within your growing area um, where the sp spirit can move in and grow alongside you. Perhaps these places that are more alive when they're growing wild um, are where we will find plants that we need to grow to grow offerings for our ancestors. Said differently, in creating Tombandu, we create a plot for our ancestors for them to grow alongside us in conversation, showing us how to grow what is truly necessary. Um, later, in that, later in that paper, because uh, I have to skip over some more stuff so I can get to some, some questions, I guess. Um, uh, different, many different um, uh, people on the continent have talked about um, termites and, and, and how these termite mounds are built up. And then when the termites move out, you can basically take that termite mound and plant almost directly into it. Um, and, and that's an aspect of life that we haven't necessarily considered how we can use insect life to make more life. Um, and so what I'm saying is for us to move tutupole into poor lele, we must create more life so that we can have more to life. For us, for those of us, especially in the United States, termites are destructive. So how can we attract more life that may have similar building habits, similar soil building habits as termites? For that, we move on to our next and final section, yam to corn meadow, creating a shovel. Um, so we introduce this term, uh, we introduce this section with the new term, a shovel. It is an agar name, uh, in the name of one of my closest friends, and it means more life, more to life. <laughs> By attracting more life to our land, having life in our compost and processing our waste resources, we allow ourselves to have more to life because life is most efficient at processing waste and we shouldn't bust our humps turning compost bins. Um, so we'll talk about black soldier fly and how we can use them uh, like our continental siblings of the soil use termites. So to do so, like yam to corn meal is waste into a better product. So I have another proverb for that. Uh, Agbado, right, <laughs> Agbado barada odiko. Um, yam, ch yam changes its state and becomes pounded yam. Corn changes its state and becomes steamed corn meal. People and things can change for the better. And so for us to do so, we must offer our waste. Um, the black soldier flies will come in and eat up all the waste. And it's very easy to attract them to your land. This is, this is throughout the whole world. And the only way you have to do that is by offering your waste. We have another proverb to illustrate this more poetically. This one's pretty long. And because I'm running out of time, I'm not gonna uh, butcher it <laughs> with my, Afri uh, my American tongue. I'll just say, um, or it says, Ashisha le laba waba. Any two shows she lay, any two shoes she lay, abawaba shin shin. What is put aside is what is there to find. He who puts excrement aside will return to find flies. One reaps with one sows. And in our particular instance, we want this to happen by taking your food, um, tying it up in a bag and let it begin to rot. It'll start getting funky. You can set it outside in a full, in a warm but fully shaded place, place where it will not dry out. The black soldier flies will be crawling around in there within uh, within about a week, um, uh, and and the black soldier flies are really important. They will prevent other house flies from showing up, other bugs from showing up. They'll turn over this stuff, uh, extremely protein rich product that you'll get. And around the world, profitable ventures are being established by attracting the black soldier flies to the living spaces. Um, people are. Um, you can sell the early state black soldier larvae for other people's farms. You can sell the mid and late stage larvae for feed supplements to dairy, cattle, poultry, and fish farms, even snake and reptile owners. And then you can sell their waste, their frass as a fertilizer. And they eat about eight times their weight in food per day, especially um, meats. And so um, in this next slide, I wanted to show you, uh, I cooked two ribeyes for the ancestors and I didn't wanna just throw it away. So I decided to feed it to the black soldier flies. So on day zero, here's the, the ribeye and some other, other vegetables I cooked with them. These are the late stage larvae who are gonna turn into flies later. And in 24 hours, you can see that they had, they had dug all these holes through them. They had took all this water out of them. And there's only that little bit of meat left. And in this video, which I'll, I don't have time to go into right now, basically five days later, the ribeyes were completely gone. It's been a couple of days. Oh. Um, 
So this is what I'm saying. With the black soldier flies, our waste become feed, fuel, and fertilizer. Um, I really want to talk about uh, biogas, but I, I will say I made a whole another episode about this called Smelling Funked Power. Um, and I really wish you would uh, really want you guys to revisit that. Um, it's at the link that I that I gave you before, jiggyjiggy.org slash BSS. Um, but with biogas um, and anaerobic digestion, that's what AD stands for. You are in a container. Um, I'm saying that you're creating the Zeptepi the very first time by submerging all of this waste that you have in a without oxygen. What you're able to do is be able to create methane gas that you can then burn. And so from nothing, you are creating the first um, uh, the first life. Um, and I was going to get into the cotton plant or do, but I don't have time. Uh, Costco is giving me uh, the signal. So I just want to say um, thank you for allowing me to sit up at you guys' feet. Here's some recommendations. I'll give the slides out um, later. Um, the name of our podcast is Jiggy Jiggy. Uh, name of our podcast is Jiggy Jiggy. And it comes from this Yoruba proverb, uh, a firmly rooted plant cannot be uprooted. And Jiggy Jiggy is the aspect of trying to uproot this plant that can't be uprooted. So I just wanted to say, I need you guys to help me with Eko Nipa Iroko because Eko Nipa Iroko is Ubuntu. Um, please find the links here, jiggyjiggy.org slash BSS, agriculture.podcast.com slash BSS. And you can always email me, mason at agriculturepodcast.com, especially if you'd like to be on the podcast. Um, it's an honor to be able to share this information with you. I've been watching the summit up here at y'all's feet at the mountaintop for several years. And it is a milestone for me, my self-styled rite of passage for you, or for me to have you all initiate me into the next stage of life. For that, I say Asante Sana, Madase Pa, Murupeo. Thank you for listening to Jiggy Jiggy. Great job, great job, Mason. Uh, I wanted to say, I didn't want to really uh, quench your spirit if, if anyone, I didn't see any questions come up. I was just, I had like a, a few kind of like broader questions that, that, that sparked my mind. I was just wondering about, you know, I'm down here in Atlanta and the, um, the correlations between, you know, the red, the Georgia red clay, as opposed to, um, you know, the, the, the soil that you were speaking on. And, um, you know, is it, is it a scenario whereas, um, cause I, I see um, some, I see farmers and they're still trying to get the soil to black, even the red clay, even though it's, it's still fertile. I'll see that I'll see them still using like composting methods to still try to get it to get it to black is is there a, um is that just like a best practice um that's 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 being used down here or is or is um you know is the red clay that we have here something something that we can work with you want to move you want to kind of when you can you want to try and move all soils to black um it's it's uh you know because the 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 aspect of the the predominance of the color of that soil that you're seeing the red clay I mean I'm I'm in I'm in Charlotte so we got we have like a kind of orange kind of red clay here also and it's because the clay is the most predominant aspect of the soil and really what these farmers are trying to do is break up that clay because clay is kind of like twice as dense as this black soil, right? Mm -hmm. So once you can get roots penetrating up in there, you can create caverns and channels and pathways and stuff like that for nutrients to go into. But the only way to do that is by growing, is by growing plants. People will say you should till and stuff like that, but what that does is create floors that are even harder to penetrate. So when you add the compost, you give more resilience to the plants and the plants are able to kind of burrow into that clay and turn it black over time gotcha gotcha now I, I i heard um it's um i was gonna ask about kind of the, the the is it any correlations between like um feng sway and vastu with um with uh when you were talking about on the indian side and i can't remember what the african name for it is but you were kind of speaking to it when you were uh, talking about how they set up the villages and they go and they kind of go in a, in a, in a, they rotate over 10 years, so to speak. Yeah. Now, is, now is, is that a, is, do you know if that correlates to like feng shui and vastu and just, you know, the setting up of areas with energies and things of that nature? 
um, I, I saw with the, um, you, you were talking about how the feces is kind of like, it's in a sense meditating in that spot to enrich that soil and then it's gonna spread out. Did I, did I follow that correctly? Um, I mean, I was I was going really fast. So some of what you're saying has been, you know, is 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 assembled in a, in a different way. But that's okay. that's my fault, not yours. Um, no, so first, firstly, like the arrangement of villages, definitely in some way, but I didn't find necessarily the spiritual aspects of that. But I know that some of, more of that stuff can be found, especially with the Batama Reba people of northern Togo and Ghana. Um, they are really well known for their their um, agri uh, architectural um, practices and stuff like that. Um, but as it relates to the and and they with those people, especially they consider the house in which they live as a living thing. So people will drink with the uh, drink with the house, you know, talk with the house, joke with the house, fight with the house, everything that you do with the other, another human being. They do with the house, right? The window may be the 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 eyes. The the front door is the mouth. You know, there's a back door into the courtyard. You know, and then they'll have like gutters, systems, and stuff like that. And that'll be the various like um, you know whether it's the uh, the uh, the the anus or the 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 urethra, right? Where are their wastes go come from? So um, the but as far as I know, I don't know this. I'm not familiar with Vash too. I'm gonna have to look that up. Um, but the, but with feng shui, I don't necessarily, I haven't learned about that being in the context of villages, just about the, that being in the context of the arrangement of thing, of the architecture of the specific house. Um, but the way that spirit moves through this village, that's a very provocative question. Um, and one that I would, uh, hope that some architecture students can answer in the future. Dope, dope. Um, well, I guess, uh, does anyone else have any questions in, in the chat by chance? Um, you feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Let's, let's make this interactive if possible. Yeah, I had a question. Um, my name is Johnny. Um, I'm from Philadelphia. And, um, I, I, I hear some too about the, um, a lot of people now, I saw on social media how they're planting um, plants and different um, herbs and water and different and different ways of doing it to like um, because we don't have the space so we're doing it on rooftops and things like that and um, I didn't know how you felt about that or you feel like trying to put it in the dirt is better so there uh, it, it depends on the relationship I mean there's there's tears right I'm not trying to Often in these spaces, right? I'll say this, you know, part of me. Many of our contemporaries within Pan Africanism will practice the no true Scotsman fallacy, right? And so they'll say, no, you're not doing it right because, you know, we're not, we're not having the right conference because we're using Zoom and that's from China. We're not having our own, you know, all of that's nonsense to me, right? I think that as long as we're getting this shit together, pardon my French, because I don't speak, you know, whatever, I don't care. Um, then we're getting it together. As long as you are blackening your green thumb, that's what matters to me, right? I'm not even saying don't compost, don't, you know, don't do with these other things. I'm just, because I wanted to think about it in this way. It's like, we need to figure out how we've been doing it in the past. So as you're talking about, as it relates to like hydroponics and stuff like that and, 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 and um, ba balcony gardening and all that kind of stuff, of course, increasing your resilience is something that you should always do, right? Growing your food wherever you can, however you can, is something that you should always do. Um, you know, I would, I would caution about using chemical fertilizers and stuff like that, but that's only if you don't know how to make your own fertilizers, you know what I mean? So whenever you can, however you can, do it, but do it with the expectation that you will be learning more and doing better in the future. Thank you. My pleasure. You have a question, Brother Vision? I saw you turned your camera on. Yeah, yeah. My name is Lance. Uh, Vision is my, my screen name. I recently obtained, me and my partner have obtained like a half an acre of land. And we were trying to grow like bamboo. And I, I know nothing about, you know, growing bamboo. What type of soil would I use for that? How would that work? 
Uh, brother, that is going to be a much longer conversation. <laughs> um, okay. But um, and and like I like I said before, um, I'm gonna just put my email in the chat. So okay. Please please contact me. Um, um, but ultimately, like bamboo is going to grow. It's a grass, right? Yeah. And and in you know in the the popular adage, a foot a day in May, right? So you're not really going to have to worry about that. The, the real issue in terms of growing bamboo, in my opinion, is processing and finding a market for that kind of stuff. So if you've already got that, if you've already got that settled, you will have no problem. One of the things that I was also, uh, one of the quotes that I wanted to mention was from the Korean Natural Farming, that they were talking about taking early bamboo shoots, the most prox proximal buds at the end, you know, when the, the plant, um, when the plant is first coming out the ground. So if you, you, what I would say to you early on is to plant bamboo, but then to have a, a, specific, a specific plot just for harvesting and making fertilizer from, all right? So by that, I'm saying when, when it's starting to erupt out of the soil, maybe in like April or something like that, collect those as they continue and start fermenting those, right? And then you ferment those, according to Korean natural farming, one-to-one -one with brown sugar, right? And so you say, say you harvested a gallon of bamboo shoots, combine that with a gallon of brown sugar, mix it all up and let it sit for like, um, maybe like two weeks. And then you can take that liquid diluted one to 500 and spread that over the bamboo that is growing. And what it'll happen is that the, the minerals and nutrients that were in those bamboo shoots to make them grow will then still be in that solution combined with sugar um, to feed the microbial life that is in the soil around the bamboo that you're trying to grow. And then the stuff that was in that bamboo will then directly move into the bamboo that you're trying to grow and it'll grow that much faster, that much stronger. Okay, you said brown sugar. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, when we talk Lance, you know, I'll, I'll overwhelm you with- All right, you all right I got you, email. I got you, yeah. email. Yeah. 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 And I, I think that's gonna be the last question. We have about five minutes until the uh until the next session, which is going to be um uh restoring our planet in people by Asa Nefrika Het Heru. I believe I um hope I didn't mess that up too bad. Um I would like to thank all our sponsors um on this on this session. Um and thank everyone for coming out. Thank you again, uh, Mason, for uh, this this profound presentation. I, I really didn't I didn't want to stop you and ask you because you were going so deep in on stuff. I, you know, I'm I'm gonna check out your podcast. I'm on my own time. Uh, looking forward to looking forward to getting that information. Um, thank thank you to everyone for coming out to the Black Sustain the sixth annual uh, Black Sustainability Summit. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.